Hello, how's everyone doing tonight? I'm going to get started in about two minutes. I hope everyone has had a great and wonderful Wednesday. Diego says hello. Natalie says hello. Hey, how are you guys doing tonight? I'm going to get started. Hi, Rebecca, how are you? Hi, Anna, how are you? Hope you guys have had a great day. A wonderful Wednesday. Hi. I'm going to get started in about two minutes. Tonight we are doing an open poetry session, reading and understanding poetry. I'm going to get started in about one minute. While we're waiting, how's everyone's day been so far? How was your day? Can we get some emojis going? Did you have a good day? Great day. Nancy, it's a tiring day. <laughs> That's understandable. It's, the, it's a Wednesday, so usually they're tiring. Someone says, a great day. Hey, Selena, how are you? Great day. Let's get some emojis. How was your day today? Congratulations, you made it. <laughs> Happy Wednesday, almost Thursday. Tonight, we're going to be doing an open poetry session for those of you who are just now joining us. Hello. Great to see you guys. Thank you for joining tonight. We're about to get started. So today we're doing an open. Dakota says, yes. Yes, I see smiley faces. Thank you for the emojis. Great. Got some emojis going. Olivia says, hi, hi. How are you tonight, Olivia? Thank you guys for joining. Olivia says, good. Olivia, I'm doing pretty good. It's been a really good day today. It's been a good Wednesday. Thank you for asking. Thanks for asking. Let's get started, guys. Today, we are going to have an open poetry session. It is going to be about reading and understanding poetry. Let's get started. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Think Fiveable. Do not forget to follow us. We would love to have you join the community at Think Fiveable. Again, we're on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So if you haven't followed it yet, make sure you join. So today we're going to learn how to read poetry. We'll focus on similes and vocabulary words. And then at the end of our session, we'll have a quick Q&A. And during that time, you'll be able to ask any questions that you have concerning poetry. And I'll try my best to answer any questions that you have. So as a quick overview, similes are two things that are comparing. So similes are used to compare two things using like or as. Vocabulary terms are any unknown word that is usually given inside of a um, poem. So today we are going to be looking at about four vocabulary terms. The first one is underbrush, underbush, I'm sorry. Underbush, mocking, echo, counter love, and boulder broken. Are any of these uh, vocabulary terms familiar to you guys? Let's get a little feedback. What? No. Dakota says no. Underbrush, mocking echo, counter love, or boulder broken. No, boulder. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any of these are familiar? I don't think so. Okay. Don't really know many of those words. Okay, Brandon, I see you. Okay, so let's talk about them. So underbrush. In a jungle, the undergrowth or the underbrush, underbush, I'm sorry, underbush are usually those underlying or those uh, maybe bushes or grasses that are growing underneath a tree or bush. So that's an underbrush. Mocking echo is a mocking, something that is constant and it's echoing. So maybe it could be maybe a constant thought or maybe something that is constantly replaying in your head and you hear it over and over again. So that's a mocking echo. 
I'm sorry, guys. If you haven't already, I hope you have your journals tonight. We're going to take a couple of notes. So I hope you have your journals or maybe something to write with if you don't have it yet. So I'll give you a minute to grab a journal, grab a notebook, grab a piece of paper so you can write, maybe take some notes to help you. Counter love. So it's kind of like counteract. So the opposite of love or to counteract or to counter love. And then boulder broken is just that a broken boulder. So a broken boulder or something that is broken, maybe a boulder like a shoulder or a boulder, something that is like on the side of a mountain. Maybe if you're living in a region where there are boulders, you'll be uh, pretty familiar with this. So this is just a simple a broken rock or a broken boulder. So I hope that uh, brought some clarity to our vocabulary terms for tonight. Again, we have underbrush, underbush, <laughs> mocking echo. And again, that is something that is replaying constantly in your head or in your mind, something that you constantly hear in a poem or maybe whatever the, speaking, the speaker hears when he or she writes a poem. Counter love is like a counterattack or the opposite of something. So counter love would be to counter the love, would be to um, almost counter or to go against love or to go for love, counter love. And then a boulder broken is simply a broken boulder. Do you have any questions before we move forward? Any questions? Any questions before we move forward? Okay, let's keep going. Give you one more minute. Any questions? Okay, let's go. So when reading poetry, it is very important to use context clues to gain a better understanding of what the poet is trying to convey or express. And then having a very strong background knowledge and context clues can really increase your reading comprehension and assist with answering key questions. So I had someone ask recently in a um, past live, how can I decrease my reading time? How can I be able to see a reading passage or see a poem and really be able to go through this reading passage really quickly in order to decrease my testing time? So my opinion would be to increase your context clue increase your vocabulary terms. Hello, Santiago. Increase your ability to read a word, know exactly what it means, know if they're using the homophone or the opposite of it, synonyms, antonyms, knowing how to exactly see a word and then break that word down in order to read the passage and understand correctly. So, I would strongly suggest practicing vocabulary words, maybe learning new vocabulary terms, maybe um, learning new words, maybe studying the dictionary. If there are any words that you do not know already, I would make flashcards. Learn a new word every day. Increase your vocabulary knowledge. Increase your capacity. That way, when you see a word, maybe you can break that word down with the Greek or Latin root. And then also the root word, prefix, suffixes, Greek and Latin roots, all of that helps with with answering questions and with helping with your context clues and vocabulary terms. Hey, Martha, how are you? Thank you guys for joining tonight. So when breaking down poetry, I love using SIF, it's, and it's a simple poetry strategy. So the S in SIF stands for symbolism. Maybe this is the part that you guys would maybe want to take notes. The S in SIF stands for symbolism, and that symbols that represent an object other, other than itself. So maybe you're looking at a poem, and maybe it has a clock. What would that clock represent? So for symbolism, what could a clock represent? Okay, I see someone says time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anything else? For symbolism, what could a clock represent? A long wait. Good, Brenda. Possibly a long wait. What about the sunrise? What could a sunrise represent? Hope. And it says hope. That says a new beginning. Great. New beginnings. Revitalization, good, new life, yes. 
good. All of these things represent symbols. So they give you a symbol, but it really means something differently. What about an ocean? What would an ocean in symbolism represent? What could an ocean in symbolism represent? The unknown, yeah. Anything else? Infinite, yes, never ending, great. Yes, an ocean could represent depth. It could represent maybe something, yes, I see isolation, great. Yes, isolation, definitely. An ocean could represent death. It could represent dreams. It could represent maybe something new, something unknown. Good. Yes. This is great. The I in Civ stands for inference. So why did the poet write this poem? And it also can help you with paraphrasing. The F in Civ represents any figurative language. So that could be similes, metaphors, refrains, repetitions, hyperboles, onomatopoeia, anything relating to figurative language would be in the F category. And then the T in SIFT stands for tone and theme. So that's basically the lesson or the more that the author would like for you to learn when reading a poem. Also for the I in SIFT, it could also represent imagery. So anytime you see the I in SIFT, it could also represent imagery. What do you see? What do you visualize when breaking down or when you're looking at a poem? Yeah. Thumbs up. Can I get some emojis if everyone is ready to move forward? Do we have any questions so far about SIFT? Any questions? Good. Olivia, I see your thumbs. Good. Any questions concerning SIFT? Good, Dakota. Good, Rebecca. Thumbs up if you're ready. Smiley emojis if you're ready. Fire emojis if you're ready. Any questions concerning SIF? Okay, let's move on. So, for today, is imagery a form of figurative language? Yes, imagery could fall in the could fall in the category of figurative language. Yes. It could be in the inference category. I'll go back. For imagery, who had someone ask, could imagery be a form of figurative language? Yes. Yes, it could. Imagery could fall in under the category of figurative language, or it also could fall under the category of symbolism, because with imagery, it's kind of like using your five senses. So something you can taste, something you could touch, something you could smell. What do you visualize when you're reading the poem? So I would definitely say yes. Imagery could fall under the category of figurative language. Good question. You're welcome. Anytime. Okay. For today, we're going to look at The Most of It by Robert Frost. And I will give you a minute to dissect and maybe possibly use sift for the poem and then let's talk about it this is an open poetry study so i would love to see you guys have dialogue it's going to be a lot of questions so i want to ask you guys questions and let's break this poem down together so the most of it by robert frost he thought he kept the universe alone for all the voice and answer he could wait was but the mocking echo of his own from some tree hidden cliff across the lake some morning from the boulder broken beach, he would cry out on life that which it wants. It's not our own love back in copy speech, but counter love, original response. And nothing ever came of what he cried unless it was the embedment that crashed. In the cliffs, Tatus on the other side, and then the far distant water splash. But after that, oh. But after that, lost my screen. Yeah. Excuse me, guys. I'm sorry. There it is. 
But after that, a time. Allow. So let's look at it. What symbolism do you guys see? But after that, allowed it for to swim. What symbolism do you see? He thought he kept it, the universe alone, for all the voice and answer he could wait was but the mocking echo of his own for some hidden cliffs across the lake. Some morning from the boulder, boulder broken beach, he would cry out on life that which it wants. It is not his own love back in copy speech, but counter love, original response, and nothing ever came of what he cried unless it was the embedment that crashed the cliffs of Talus on the other side. And then in the far distant water splash, and after a time allowed for it to swim. Let's break this poem down. What symbolism do you guys see? What symbolism do you see? Okay, I see personification. Yes, there's definitely some personification. I see some alliteration. What symbols do you see in this poem? And what could those symbols represent? Let's talk about it. What symbols do you see inside the poem? Good, the symbol of his voice. Anything else? He kept the universe alone, seems to represent like his life, where he was alone, mocking echo serves as, yeah, that's good. Any other symbols? The symbol of the beach. Good. So what could that beach represent? What could that water represent? Yes. Possibly his tears. Yeah, that's good. What about the universe? He thought he kept the universe alone. For all the voice and answer he could wait. Mocking echo meaning loneliness. Yes. Yes. This is good. So what I'm thinking, possibly, yes, Taz, I agree, possibly loneliness. So when he thought he kept the universe alone, for universe, I think about mind, and I think about possibly in his mind, he felt as if he was alone. For all the voice and answer, he could wake. So I think about his voice, and he thinks in the morning time that possibly that it's only him, possibly loneliness, loneliness but was the mocking echo of his own. So every time he arose, every time he heard something, it was the mocking echo of his own voice. I also think about possibly when you're on the beach alone or when you're in a cave sometimes, the only voice that you can hear is your own. So possibly it was the mocking echo of his voice from some hidden tree cliff across the lake. So possibly he was in a cliff and all he could hear was the mocking echo of his own voice, which I agree. I heard a lot of people saying loneliness. Yes, I totally agree. The mocking echo. I like how uh, Rebecca also said that the symbolism of the beach could also represent his tears. Which also helps with understanding that it could mean loneliness. Some morning from the boulder broken beach, he would cry out on life that what it wants. It is not its own love back in copy speech, but counter love, original response. So when I think of he would cry out on life that what it wants, he's almost asking like, what do you want for me? What can I do? And nothing ever came of what he cried. So he never got an answer. He constantly asks, what do you want for me? And nothing ever came from what he cried, unless it was the embedment that crashed. So unless it was the the waves that crashed upon the upon the shore. That was the only answer that he received. The cliffs on the other side and then in the far distant water splash. And after that, 
a time allowed for it to swim. So almost at the end of that poem, the only response that he ever received, and this is only the first stanza of the poem for the illustration, I only used the first half of it, but he never received the answer. So it really makes me think, what about figurative language? I heard someone say, and I saw someone say earlier, that they saw personification. Any other figurative language? Do you see any internal rhyme, external rhyme? Someone said personification earlier. I see some alliteration, good imagery. Anything else? Good, yes. Any other forms of figurative language? Good, I see some metaphors, yes. Broken Boulder Beach is definitely some alliteration. Cry out on life. It is not his own love back in copy speech, but counter love original response. He thought he kept the universe alone. All the voices and answer he could wait. Definitely some personification. Yes, metaphors. Definitely. Okay, let's hop to theme. What is the theme and the tone of this poem? What theme do you think? Why did the author, why did Robert Frost write, write this poem? What do you think he was trying to convey? What do you think he was trying to express? And what is the tone of the poem? Yes, Anna says loneliness, possibly, yeah. It has really a underlining, kind of melancholy kind of tone. Anything else? Yes, despair. Tone seems to be pretty sober and gloomy, yeah. Possibly a desire for love. You can always get what you ask for. Yeah, that's good. I love these different themes. Yeah. Anyone else? What's the theme and tone? Theme and tone. I like how you said you can always get, yes, the tone is pretty serious. Thanks, Olivia. The tone is pretty serious. I really think when I look at this poem, I think about how sometimes we ask questions in life and we want to know. Yeah, sometimes there's no explanation for what happens in life. Yeah, that's good. Sometimes we want to know what's next or we want to know, you know, maybe during those solemn moments when he's alone on the beach, maybe thinking about memories. He kept he thought he kept the universe alone. So he thought he was the only one there for all the voices and answer he could wake. But it was the mocking echo of his own. So the only voice he could he could really hear or wake was his own voice. So it could possibly also mean self-discovery. Like the only voice that he could hear was the voice of his own, the echoing of his own thoughts. And then at the end of the poem, it says the distant far water splash. So the only response that he could hear was the water splashing. Possibly. Do you have any questions so far about Sith, theme, tone, figure of language, symbolism? Any questions so far concerning our poem? Any questions? Okay, great question, Joel. What would I classify the tone as? To be honest with you, I feel that the tone could be hopeful. And it also could have like a self-discovery tone. It does give you a melancholy kind of underlining, almost depressing feel. But at the end of it, I really believe that it gives me hope because it, it shows me that this, uh, the author really wrote this, from my perspective, as self-discovery. Or what would a proper theme be for this poem? Great, great question. Theme, from in my opinion, would be self-discovery, maybe um and I'll write this out for you, maybe possibly self-discovery or really almost uh, being OK with the echoing voice, being OK with the solitude or being alone, because at the end of it, he had to be, uh, be OK with his voice. He had to be OK with maybe not receiving the answers to all of his questions, because at the end of it and then in the far distant water splash and after that, it allowed for a time to to, to swim. So he never received and nothing ever came of what he cried. So he never received answers to his cries. Possibly never received the answers to things that you're crying or maybe worrying about. 
I hope that answers your question. So for tone, I would say maybe a melancholy or possibly a hopeful. Possibly remaining hopeful, even though you don't have the, the correct answer to what you're asking for. And then for theme, remaining resilient, even though you don't have the answers to your questions, even though, even though that an answer never came from his cry. Okay, next we're going to look at some question stems. So let's look at it. But before we do, we already answered the question, what is the tone of the poem? And a lot of you guys said that the tone is pretty serious. Someone said that it was a desire for love. And then we also asked, what imagery is used inside of the poem? So let's talk about it. what imagery, what do you visualize when you see this poem? What's some of the things that you visualize? What imagery is used? Olivia says possibly someone crying. Anything else? Looking out on the ocean, a big forest, lots of nature. Yeah. Any other imagery? What imagery is used inside of the poem? Anyone else? Any imagery? What do you visualize? What do you see? What do you smell? What possibly taste could you see? Possibly someone sitting in a chair looking at the ocean. Yeah. What could possibly be in his hands? All of these things can help with sensories. Yeah. Someone possibly looking out on the ocean. I'll tell you what I see. I see almost like the sunset. Possibly someone walking and pondering the things of life. I hear the waves crashing. Yeah, Dakota says a windy scene. Same thing I see. Yep, a storm possibly on the way. Yes, all of these things, exactly what I see. Different things, waves crashing. Maybe I hear the wind blowing. Maybe I see the sun rolling down. These are all good. Possibly a storm on the way. Maybe a windy scene. I like how Martha says someone sitting in a chair looking at the ocean, a big forest, lots of nature. Maybe uh, Dakota said him looking out on the ocean, possibly someone sad, someone crying. These are all great. These are great. Thanks for sharing, guys. Okay, next, let's look at some question stems. So the first question is, in this poem, the speaker perceives that for human beings, nature is most likely which of the following? A, nurturing and supportive. B, hostile and violent. C, unpredictable and unknowing. Good, I see C, D. D, unaware and indifferent. And E, oppressive and sinister. Let's talk about it. Dakota says D, I see C, C. Tad says C, yeah. Brandon says C. Good. In this poem, the speaker perceives that the hum for human beings, nature is most likely which of the following. So again, with that imagery, breaking that poem down could really help with answering possible question stems. So let's go through them. A, nurturing and supportive. Based off of the text, I do not believe that A would be an answer simply because he never received the answers to his questions. So I would immediately X out A. Be hostile and violent. Again, towards the end of the poem, and I'll go back. It never gave a hostile, storming, lightning, dramatic, hostile and violent feel. See, unpredictable and unknowable. Again, at the end of that poem, we never received the answers. He never received what he was asking. So possibly. D, unaware and indifferent. Again, I feel like he was very aware, self-aware for this poem. He knew exactly how he, how he felt. And E, oppressive and sinister. So based off of E, this would be, in my opinion, the trick question. So in every question, you always have, you know, two possibles. 
three of them maybe you already can eliminate and then out of these two I, I would possibly choose e or c so then i would go back into my thought my thinking process and say okay oppressive and sinister i know that the tone of this poem was possibly lonely possibly uh remaining hopeful in spite of not having the answers so i wouldn't choose e simply because it doesn't really give me an oppressive overbearing overpowering feel sinister it really didn't give me an evil feel or make me feel like evil was chasing me or maybe darkness so i would definitely for all of those of you who chose c you are correct great job the answer is c so give yourself some smiley emojis because you guys did a great job do we have any questions concerning the the question so far good i see some smiley emojis some shade emojis some happy emojis i love it any questions before we move forward Any questions? I see some happy faces, some smiley faces. Yes, Brandon is excited. He has his two praise hands. <laughs> Can we get some thumbs up if we're ready for the next question? Thumbs up emojis. We're ready for the next question. Good, Brandon's ready. Good. Okay. Next question. Good, Olivia's smiling. Olivia, you're ready, good. Okay, next question. The echo is mocking in line three because the speaker, A, had hope for some response to his call, B, is cynical about the other human beings, C, has despaired of the existence of God, D, is being ridiculed by other travelers in the woods, or he is humor is humorously criticizing himself and his aloneness. The echo is mocking in line three because the speaker A had hope for some response to his call. B is cynical about other human beings. C has despaired about the existence of God. D is being ridiculed by other travelers in the wood, and E is humorously criticizing himself and his aloneness. I'll give you a minute, let's break this down. See a lot of people are saying E, E, E. A lot of people are saying E, let's look at this. Mocking Echo. She says, I think it's A, C, or D. Hmm. <laughs> let's look at it. So the first thing I would do is go back so i'm going to give you one more minute to look at the question then we're going to go back and reread line three i think it's always a good idea to go back to the text reread make sure i have a great understanding of it and then answer the question so let's go back so line three he thought he kept the universe alone for all the voice and answer he could wake, but was but the mocking echo of his own from some tree hitting cliff across the lake. Pretty humorous. He was mad because he could hear the mocking echo of his own from some tree hitting cliff across the lake. Some morning from the boulder broken beach, he would cry out on life that what it wants. It is not our own love back in copy speech, but counter love, original response. Let's start right there. So if we look back at line three, he thought he kept the universe alone for all the voice and answer he could wait was, was but the mocking echo of his own from some tree hidden cliff across the lake. So I know that he's alone. The only thing he could hear was the echo from the tree hidden cliff across the lake. So he was by the cliff across from the lake and it was mocking him. So what do you think this mocking echo could possibly mean? Before we make our decision, what does this mocking echo mean?
what could his mocking echo mean? What could his mocking echo represent? Does it give you a, a humorous tone, a voice inside of him, just his thoughts repeating again and again, no real response? Yeah. Yeah. He's asking questions. Proof that he kept the universe alone and that no one is there for him except himself. Good. Yeah. He's constantly asking these same questions. He felt like he was alone and the only voice that he could recognize or hear was his mocking echo. So possibly he was speaking aloud. And he keeps hearing this same echo across the lake, answering his questions. Good, Rebecca. Possibly his inner thoughts. Good. So let's go back to the questions. The echo is mocking in line three because the speaker, A, had hoped for some response to his call. B, is cynical about other human beings. C, has despaired of the existence of God. D is being ridiculed by other travelers in the woods. E is humor humorously criticizing himself and his aloneness. Remember to eliminate those that you know is not the correct answer. So let's look at it together. A, he had hoped for some response to his call. That is a possible answer. B, he is cynical about other human beings. Again, we really didn't speak about other humans. C, has despaired of the existence of God. I will cross that one out. Wasn't really a topic. D, is being ridiculed by other travel travelers in the woods. Not really an option. I would ask that one out. And then E, is humorously criticizing himself and his aloneness. So, out of E and A, what would your final answer, answer be? Knowing we would eliminate B, C, and D. What would your final answer be? A or E? Jewel says E. Let's get some answers rolling. What would your final answer be out of A and E? Any more final answers? Have E so far. Give about one more minute. Any final answers? Dakota says A. E. E. Good, E. E, Diego says E, Natalie, E, Olivia, E. Good. Pat says E. Great. Based off of specifically line three, it did have a humorous feel. Based off of the overall poem, he had hoped for some response to his call. If I'm looking at the entire poem, and if, if this if the question stem could have possibly possibly said based off the entire text or based off the entire poem, what could the mocking in the poem be? I would have chosen A. But because the question is specifically saying the echo is mocking in line three because the speaker, I would have chosen, drumroll please. E is humorously criticizing himself and his aloneness. So it's almost, he's making a mockery of himself. He, he has nothing else to do but laugh at himself and criticize himself because of his aloneness. Oh, Dakota has a sad face, I'm sorry. But thank you for trying, great job at trying. Keep up the hard work, there's more to come. So remember when you're analyzing question stems, Always eliminate 
and then decide, especially specifically with poetry, is this question asking me an overall thing or is this question specifically asking me something relating to a line? So for this one, it was tricky specifically because it was asking you something that could have possibly tricked you. Because if I'm looking at the overall theme of the poem, I would have chosen A. That was a trick question. But because we were only looking at line three, I chose E. So give yourself a great smiley emoji if you got that one correct. Good job. Congratulations. Good. And if you didn't get this one correct, it's okay. That's what open poetry sessions are for to increase our capacity and to help us learn and grow. Okay, let's do a quick check. What strategy can you use to decrease your reading time? So let's share out. What are some strategies that you guys use in related to poetry that can decrease your reading time? Rebecca said skim through the text. It's a great strategy. Skim through the test, text, see if I recognize anything. Natalie says she reads the questions first. That's great. So you'll know exactly what you're looking for anymore. What strategies can you use to decrease your reading time? Annotating, good. Great annotation strategy could be notice and note. Contradictions. But repetition is a great uh, annotating strategy as well. What do you notice being uh, repeated over and over again? Because usually when it comes to poetry, those refrains and repetition can really be something that the author really wants to try to convey. Anna says underlining. Olivia says annotating. Great. Any more? What strategies can you use to decrease your reading time? Because that was only a small snippet of the poem. I cut off maybe the, the second half of that poem. That poem was about two stanzas long. So we only broke down the first stanza. But I really believe using those annotations, using SIFT, reading the questions first, really knowing exactly how to answer the questions can really help. Good. How can you grow to learn new vocabulary to, to assist with analyzing poetry? What are some things that you can do to learn new vocabulary? Or what are some things you have done in the past to learn new vocabulary? Now it says read, reading a dictionary, yes. Reading, yes, 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 yes. For something that I would like to use, good books, yes. I like to hop genres. So sometimes if I'm reading informational text, is a great tool to learn different words. Also, uh, fiction, expository text. Yes, visit a spelling bee. Yes, create note cards. Um, maybe speaking with someone who knows more than you. I also believe that you also, you you should always have someone in your circle that knows more than you that you can pull and reflect from. Reading different types of genres. Sometimes it's really easy to get caught up on reading one specific type of of book. Or maybe it's your favorite book, or maybe maybe it's your favorite author. But sometimes you have to stretch your capacity, stretch your capacity to learn different genres, different books, study Greek and Latin roots. All of those can really assist when breaking down poetry. Also, studying prefixes, suffixes, and root words. Really understanding prefixes and breaking those words down. That way, you'll know during the test what those mean. Yeah, always look up the words that you don't know at that moment. Definitely. If it's something and I'm practicing, if I do if I do not know what that word means, definitely go back into the text and find out. Use a dictionary. Does SIF assist you with analyzing poetry? How did you guys enjoy using SIF today? Was it helpful? Do you think it, it could assist you with poetry? How did you like using the SIF strategy? How did you like using the SIF strategy? Did everyone enjoy it? 
Now it says it's very helpful. I think it was helpful. Anyone else? How did you enjoy using the SIF strategy? Good. Anna said she enjoyed it. Could it help you? Do you think it could increase decrease your uh your reading time? Did breaking down that poem really assist? Pulling out those key vocabulary terms, really imagining, making inference in the code that she loves it. Yes. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Just want to make sure everyone has a good understanding of it, how to use it, how it can be used to assist you with breaking down poems. Good, thank you. Very helpful. Do you have any questions before we move on to the Q&A session? Any questions concerning SIF? Any questions concerning new vocabulary terms? Any questions concerning decreasing your reading time? Any questions before we move on to the Q&A? Okay, let's start the Q&A. So, what questions do you have concerning poetry? Let's talk about it. What questions do you have concerning poetry? Maybe it's something that's been bubbling on the inside of you. You've been wanting to ask it all day, all this evening. It doesn't have to be anything deep. Does it appear more on the exam than poetry or prose? Is poetry a major part of the exam? Based off of my research, poetry, poetry, here the same. Does it appear more on the exam than prose? Is poetry a major part of the exam? Poetry. Okay, great question. Based off of my research, is contrast big in poetry? Okay, so with contrast, could you uh, elaborate a little bit more? What do you mean by contrast? You mean compare and contrast? How do you understand the meaning of a poem? Okay, these are great questions. Okay, so I'll start with the first one. Does it appear to, on a poem on the test more? Based off of my research, recently I did a little research and I saw approximately about three poems. So ranging from about maybe I saw one that was three stanzas long, another one that was about two stanzas long. I saw a lot of similes and metaphors. So I would definitely, if you don't have a, a good grasp on similes and metaphors, I would definitely review that. Um, the next question says, that is, is poetry a major part of exam? Again, I saw about maybe three poems. Based off of my research, what do you think I can do in order to understand old literature? Great question. So. I would suggest listening first because you have to determine what kind of learner are you. Are you an auditor, auditory learner? Are you more hands-on? Are you kinesthetic? Are you visual? So first I would analyze what type of a learner am I? And then I was I would use that information based off the person that I am to study. So for me, I'm a movement person. I like to move when I'm learning. I like hands-on. So if I'm studying poetry, I need to touch my paper. I need to analyze. I need colors in my hand. And then I would also listen to different poetry. And then studying key vocabulary, breaking down poetry, learning the background of the author really could help too. Putting yourself in that mindset of what, what kind of life that that author lived, studying. So you need to cross-examine. So I would not only just study poetry, but also, I would also study informational texts concerning the poet to really help me understand exactly what mindset that poet was in when they wrote the poem. That'll really help. Also studying Greek and Latin roots, studying vocabulary terms. Um, another question, how can you understand the meaning of a poem with complex vocabulary? Again, studying before the quiz, having a strong academic vocabulary, I would suggest. Going into it, I would study new terms, 
I would also cross-examine and learn different genres. I wouldn't stay married or stay stuck into learning only one genre. I would also study, maybe study poetry this week, maybe study informational text next week, maybe study prose the other week, maybe study fiction, fables. I would give myself a variety of different terms to learn. That way, it, it broadens your capacity and it really helps you to understand and it gives you a taste of different vocabulary words used in different contexts. Someone says, I'm gonna take about two more questions. I love the questions that you guys have. Epic simile, we're reading the Iliad. Do you know what an epic simile is? And if you do, how can identify the epic simile? Let's find out. An epic simile, I'll come back to you, Dakota. Let me research really quick an epic simile because I want to make sure I clarify your answer. What techniques can I use if I do not understand what the poem is about? Great question. Sift. If I do not understand what that poem is about, first I would think about the author. So if I already know about the author, that helps me understand the poet in the poem. If I understand what life that, that, that the, uh, the poet lived, were they, for example, Emily Dickens, Dickinson, Dickerson. She lived a very solemn life. She lived alone. So a lot of her poetry expresses that. It wasn't until later in her life that she became more of an open person, but she was very introverted. Um, a lot of the information texts that I read concerning her explains that she, she really wasn't a talker and she would write some of her best poems alone. But one of her last, the last poems that she wrote it was because she came in community with another poet and he pulled the greatness out of her. So I think it's very important when analyzing poetry to use Sif, but also to study various poet, poetry and poets. Someone else asked a question, contrast where there is one perspective idea then turn to a different, oh, thank you. So contrast where is there one perspective idea and then a turn to a different perspective on the idea. So almost kind of like, uh, Third person, second person, first person, like different perspectives of the idea. So let's go back and look at your question. You asked. Hmm, about comparing. And then I was also looking up the question concerning epic similes. So epic similes are a homeric simile also uses an epic simile. It is detailed comparison form. It's based on the Greek author. So examples of epic similes could be cracking roots, blaze, and hiss. So when I look at epic similes, it also it all it almost makes me think about personification. So it's almost like the marrying of personification with similes and if i'm wrong can someone uh, clarify but it almost makes me think about the marrying of personification with similes so i hope that clarifies your answer guys you had some great questions tonight i hope that every oh you're welcome i hope everyone i was able to answer your questions Thank you guys so much for coming on tonight. Thank you, Rebecca. I really enjoyed our lesson. I enjoyed the open poetry session. I think you guys did a great job breaking down those questions. Thank you for joining. I enjoyed the quick the Q and A. I enjoyed the feedback. I enjoyed the smiley faces, the emojis. Thank you. I hope you guys have a great week too. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the dialog conversation box. Do not forget to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Until next time, I hope to, to see and have you guys in the Think Fiveable lives again. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And I hope you have, guys have a great and wonderful week. 
continue to study, continue to do great things, continue to study those vocabulary terms, use SIFT, even in class, you sift, break that poem down, find a strategy that is specifically for you that will help you and assist. And I hope you guys have a wonderful week. See you next time.